Okay, and I think we've given everybody enough time to, to go grab their plants. So we're gonna go ahead and go to the next slide. But for those of you who were not in attendance last week, my name is Charlie Davis. I am with Two Women in a Wagon Urban Farm, which is a um, an urban mini farm here in Lithonia. And so I am very excited to do this six part garden series with you all. Um, and again, what we're gonna be covering today is just picking up from where we left off last week and each lesson is going to build on the week before. Uh, if you have questions or topics that you would like uh, considered and we have not already covered them, make sure that at the end of this, you get my email address because if you send me your questions, I can incorporate them into our lesson each week just to make sure that everything you need is addressed. So what we're gonna be covering today, we're gonna start off with our homework review. Uh, we're also going to be talking about technology and gardening. Um, I know some of us may not be very friendly with technology, but once I show you some of the different apps uh, and discuss some of the different apps and what they can do, I'm hoping to kind of win you over and, and just show you some of the resources that will be really, really helpful to you, especially as a new gardener. And then the last thing that we're going to be talking about today is companion planting. And we're going to be going through some companion guides uh, and just kind of helping you put together your fall garden uh, in a, a way that is going to be most beneficial uh, for you for the fall. So if we'll, we can go on to the next slide, please. Okay, so our homework from last week, I, I gave you a, a three point, excuse me, a three part homework assignment last week. Uh, the first one was, it's all about the mulch. Um, you were supposed to be researching different types of mulch. And so is there anyone who'd like to share with me what you learned about mulch from your homework assignment last week? I learned that there's organic and inorganic mulch and that organic mulch is from living materials such as chopped leaves, um, straw, grass, compost, wood chips, shredded bark, and even paper. Absolutely. And inorganic mark, um, would be things such as black plastic or um, landscape fabric. Absolutely. So let me give you a two-part question on that and bonus points for doing your homework. But tell me, what is the purpose of mulch? So for those who didn't attend last week, can you just tell me overall, what's just the purpose of mulch? To keep the moisture in the plant. To keep the moisture in the plant. And what else? Uh, compost can actually enrich the soil. It enriches the soil when you're using the organic um, compost. Um, and what's another really, really good reason? And for those of you who've been gardening for years, I'm sure somebody's going to pipe up with this one. What's another really good reason that you should be mulching? It regulates the temperature. It regulates the temperature. Minimize weeds. Yes, that is it. That's what I was looking <laughs> for. Minimizes those weeds. So if any of you are going in ground, especially, uh, or even with raised beds, if you've had them for a while, uh, pulling weeds is just, you know, um, part of the course anytime you have a garden. But mulching, again, improves the soil. It retains moisture. It also makes sure that you don't have to pull as many weeds. It feeds your plants. So there's just quite a few benefits to uh, making sure that you're mulching your garden. I always suggest uh, organic mulch. I know a lot of people like to use um, the black uh, plastic sheathing and, and so forth to cover the gardens personal preference. And again, anything with gardening, if you talk to 100 people who garden, 99 of them will have different things that they're doing in their garden. And so I encourage you to play around with gardening, learn what works best for your yard. Uh, anyone else who did the research on mulch have anything that they want to add that we didn't cover already? Did you mention that is, because uh, I'm just toning, toning in, hi everyone. Did you mention about the colored mulch, the difference in color and the difference in the brown? Did I miss that? The well, color is well, more dyed. Well, go ahead. Well, go ahead. Uh, yeah, it's more dyed, right? And it's not really for the food, but the other for the plant is pretty for plants. But that dye, don't it go into the food? 
Yes, and I'm, I'm so glad that you mentioned that. And what she's talking about is the colored mulch that we all use to put around our crepe myrtles and our other uh, flowering bushes just to beautify the garden. You don't ever want to use that mulch around your, your food crops. And that's simply because they have dye. But there's another reason about why you shouldn't use them around your food plants. Does anyone else know why you shouldn't use the colored mulch around your food plants? And thank you for reminding me of that, Bridget. Donna. Oh, I'm sorry, Donna. My apologies. <laughs> Bridget's name flashed across my screen. I realized it was just saying that's my host. Anyone else? <coughs> okay. When you look at the colored mulch when you're going to buy it from the, um, the garden supply stores, quite a few of them actually have a weed prevention in them. And so if I put mulch around my plants that I'm growing food and it has chemicals in it to uh, prevent weeds, what happens to the things that I'm growing? It's going to prevent it from growing too. It's going to prevent, prevent that from growing as well. I actually set up a garden for someone um, last year and we had all of this mulch there that the trees that were cut up that she was going to use and she said she got tired and she put all of that mulch in these huge beds that she built and uh, bought 60 bags of, of mulch that we're gonna to totally prohibit her garden from growing. So you wanna make sure that you're only using uh, colored mulch around your non-food plants. So thank you for that. Okay, uh, does anyone else have anything they'd like to add as far as mulch? I learned that I have mulch all over my yard um, courtesy of these pine trees that are everywhere. Yes, and tell me something that you learned about the pine needles as far as mulch. That they hold well. Um, I used it to fill holes in my backyard, but now they, they use for my garden. And I, I like it. It's easier. I don't have to buy it. It's free. So Absolutely. But, but one thing that you want to remember, and I want everybody, because I know most of us here in Georgia have a surplus of pine trees. I know I have dozens in my backyard. So one thing that you want to make sure that you're, you're remembering when you use the pine needles is that they, they, are, they do have a little bit more acidity than other mulches that you're going to use. So they're great for plants that really love acid, like your, um, your uh, azaleas, um, your blueberries, things like that. But overall for your garden, you kind of want to be careful with pine if you're using that as your only source of mulch because it does raise the acidity level of your soil. Okay, so anything else on mulch before we go on to the second part of our homework? Uh, yes, you mentioned um, coconut husk. Is it C-O-I-R? It's called core? Yes, absolutely. And you said you, you had to order that from well, you can get it from the big box stores. I personally buy the compressed uh, coconut. And again, it's, it's a, a bit pricier than other mulches, but for me, it, it will last a couple of years so I don't have to replace it as often. You can also grow directly in coconut core. So I use it sometimes when I'm starting seedlings, um, but I order it um, through Amazon. And if you're interested, let me know at the end and I'll get you the exact name um, of the one that I, that I order. And it comes in a comp uh, price brick and you just add it to water and it expands um, about six times its size. And so it is a one, if you have a standard uh, three by six bed or four by eight bed, one brick would be enough to cover your whole bed. But again, there's quite a few mulches out there that are free. And so unless you're, you know, unless you just like to invest in, in something, it's, it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so the second part of your homework was to look at what you are currently growing in your garden and research what pests you should be worried about for those plants. So does anyone want to tell me what they're currently growing and based on their research, what pests they should be on the lookout for? All right, Donna is into it now, so I can tell you. <laughs> okay. So there's those white flies. Yes. And they love, um, squash and those uh, asparagus. So I don't have asparagus in my yard, but I do volunteer at the school. And I remember that they were really in those asparagus. I just turned, I got in there kind of late. 
to to and so they were already up the asparagus was mm -hmm. and i just moved it out and those flies flew every place oh yes yeah um, and it was really where that they were the plant was diseased and it looked terrible so we ended up just pulling it out because it had been neglected mm -hmm. but, but i think that's it the squash and those asparagus so right so and and white flies you'll see white flies a lot um if you're especially if you're growing leafy vegetables leafy vegetables should really be grown in season which is the beginning part of the year and in your fall garden when you grow them this time of year you are going to have more pest problems because they're out of season and and that's why you grow them seasonally to ensure that you don't have to spend uh as much time and investment on on trying to, to handle pest control but white flies are, are a definite issue Okay, and anybody else? I know if someone's growing tomatoes or squash, they have some pests that, that have probably already peaked their head that they uh, found during their research as well. Does anyone I'm else have tomatoes. Also, um, I have tomatoes and peppers and um, hornworms, cutworms, aphids, white flies, army worms, bee, flea beetles for peppers. And it's a lot of the same ones, but in mm -hmm. addition, to everything for tomatoes. I also saw nematodes. This week was my first encounter with um, hornworms. Mm -hmm. And um, thankfully last week I attended your class. And so I ran to the store and got BT and that handled the problem. And I haven't seen any other evidence of it, but um, I, I noticed it, the, the day before I just randomly happened upon one and then the very next morning, I just so happened to learn what hornworm droppings look like. They and look like little grenades, how, yes. You have to, yep, you have to elaborate on I that. <laughs> yeah, and that's how I knew. And I ended up finding six hornworms, but they were all at the top of my plant. And I learned that they start at the top and if you find them at the bottom, it's like, well, your plant is no longer there. Um, right. And, and so I luckily found them all at the top of Oh, you were very lucky because one hornworm can wipe out a tomato plant overnight. So if you had six, they were about to to wipe you out. Yeah. So, so uh, has anyone else here had any encounters with the hornworms? Yes, I have. Um, I have a tomato plant and I have squash. Um, I had to kill the, the squash plant was too, was so invaded. I forget the name of it. It's a little white worm that it gets into the stalk of the plant. Vine borers. Mm -hmm. Yes, they were, cause I, I knew that I saw the leaves turning yellow. So I was like, oh my God, something's like taking the nutrients from the plant. I know I was warding it fine. And I um, cut, when I cut into the stalk and I know you said to look for the, you can see where they bore into yes. the stalk. Mm -hmm. And so I, as soon as I cut into it, I cut the worm and I was like, oh my God, it was, it was just too invaded into it. And it was already at the soil level. So I knew it was done. So I just had to pull the whole plant up and then I was able to save the zucchini and then my tomato plant. I luckily, I have seen the hornworm every time and pull, I've only pulled two so far, but I put, I actually put a little seven dust on there. I know you don't like oh. to use it. I know. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> Hold on. I am going to pause I in missed, there. <laughs> I know. I missed that lesson. I'm sorry. I have to get, keep from getting off. <laughs> and, and, and I'm going to pause you for just a second. For those of you who are new to garden, uh, seven dust is um, something that you can spray on your, your, your plants to handle your, your pest. It is not organic. It is toxic. It is poison. I don't support it. I 100 believe in fully organic gardening. And, I, and I'm glad that you mentioned that because I'm not sure if you heard what the young lady before you said she was using, but she's using what's called BT. Are you familiar with that? BT, I read about it and but it was, you know, too late, but I'm going to go get some of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. As long as you can take the pledge that you won't use seven again, I'm okay with it. Okay. Yes, Wait, are you saying be like David or be like? Where do you get the it's BT B as, from? It's, it's B as in boy, T as in Thomas. Okay. And if you actually search for BT for your garden, you'll see a bunch of different companies. If I try to pronounce the full name for you, I'm going to butcher and destroy it. But I promise you, if you just search for B as in boy, T as in Thomas for the garden, you'll see several different varieties that come up. Now, BT is specifically for softer um, uh, things like caterpillars, um, you know, things like that. You're not going to use it on things like your beetles and, and, and things like that. It is specifically for grubs and, and, and things that have a, a softer um, exoskeleton. 
So um, you definitely, if you haven't invested, the three things that you really want to use for your garden for organic practices, and each of them have a, a different pest that they are uh, specifically geared towards, which was the purpose of this um, assignment. So one is BT, the other one is neem oil, and all of these you can get from any of your garden supply stores, or if you're like me and you love online shopping, they are available online through various different suppliers. Uh, and then the last thing that you want is diatomaceous earth, and you want to make sure that it's food grade. I have a question for you for um, like monitoring. I think one of my hard learned lessons for this uh, growing season is to be to to apply this stuff even when I don't see it. Yep. Um, and but like, is there a certain schedule? Because I don't want to be like, OK, well, I, I, I think I should do it weekly or whatever. But like, don't do it all in the same day. Do like one, then the next, the next day. Like, how do you apply it? Like. Okay, well, that's a good one. And, and thank you for that. Now, let me say this. Prevention is the best thing that you can do. So one of the things that I do, and, and also, and let me just say this, even if something is organic, it doesn't mean that it's still not harmful to the other uh, pollinators, such as bees and so forth. So you want to make sure that when you are treating your plants, that you're treating like the leaves and the base of the plants, you don't ever want to treat the flowers themselves. So um, DE is actually a powder. Um, the um, BT and the neem oil are, are both liquids, but with the diatomaceous earth specifically, I mix it actually in with water and I apply it as a spray instead of powdering my entire plants down and so I everything gets a, a good spray down about once a week if I see a problem um, one thing that I want you all to get in the habit of especially as first-time gardeners is there are different bugs that come out during the day there are different bugs that come out at night so a lot of times you don't know you you have you don't have a excuse me you don't know that you have a pest problem because you're not checking your garden at night so I encourage you just one night about 9 30 10 o'clock once the sun has gone down Go out there with your flashlight and look under your leaves and around your plants, and you'll be surprised at the things that are hanging out there. So yes, you do want to try to use your, um, especially this time of year, you want to make sure that you're treating your gardens about once a week if you believe that you have a problem. If you are not seeing any evidence of a problem, you're not seeing webbing on your leaves, you're not seeing all and the leaves all of a sudden turning oh, yellow or drooping. Say that again, please. I'm not sure if someone was asking you a question or if they just weren't muted. So if you if you had a question, I didn't hear it. I think they were just not muted. Okay, okay. But I so, have a question. Okay. You what was the third one? You say BT neem oil, and what was the third one? It's diatomaceous earth, also called D E D as in David, E as in Edward. And if you search for D E for the garden, it will come up because no one wants to sm spell out diatomaceous earth. So. Neem oil, how do you use that? Do you just put a, some drops in water or how, how do you yes. do it? And, and, and all of these, I want you to make sure that you're actually following the ingredients on the label itself. Neem oil, you're going to be mixing it with water when you apply it. And if you read the bottle, it'll tell you how much neem oil to add to the water. And neem oil is one of the things that you want to make sure that you're applying at night. You don't want to apply it full sun because it can burn your plants. So if you're a little bit leery, what I would su suggest that you do, if it's the first time that you've used neem oil, put it on one plant, put it on there at night, and then wait a day so that you can kind of see how the neem oil is impacting your plant before you treat the, the entire garden. So there's a special neem oil for plants because I have like neem oil, you know, that I use in my diffusers and, and little things that I do. No, it's 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 actually the same neem oil um, that you're that you're using. But I would the reason that I would suggest that you buy the one specifically for the garden is it's a different concentration. Okay, great. Yeah, I put it the one that I have here that says for roses, um, house plants, and garden okay. vegetables. That's exactly it, right there. Okay. Can everyone see her? Yeah. Okay, great. So. Um, Charlie, one one question. Yes, ma'am. I haven't been gro growing anything in my backyard because one of my neighbors has got about 22 cats. So you want to know what you can do for the cats? What can I do to keep them away 
if I if I say I want to do a raised bed, they're gonna go in there and treat it like their poop house. Well, we have a we get a lot of stray cats. They don't ever go into like my raised beds ever. Um, but one thing that you can do if you because I know there are some people I have know a few of you on the call, we've had this discussion before. You can actually take plastic forks and you can stick them up in the soil around your plants and it will discourage the cat from wanting to go in there because they can't sit down or get comfortable. Okay. The other, there are other things that you can do for cats, um, like uh, you can use coyote urine, which you can buy from any big box store, any, you know, uh, any garden supply store, and you, you actually um, mix it with water and put it around your raised beds, and the cats will kind of stay away because they, sp they smell that predatory smell. Okay. Is that how, do you keep, how, do you keep, how do you keep deers away? Well, you got anything for that? Well, deers, you're going to have to put up, um, deers are very, very aggressive eaters. So yeah. if they want it, they're coming. Um, the best thing that you can do is put up some type of fencing uh, for them. You know, they have the, the deer fencing that's usually about eight to 10 feet tall. Um, but putting it in a raised bed and putting up barriers on the raised bed themselves, like putting fencing up around the raised bed is, is probably the, the most effective thing you're going to be able to do for deers because, again, they will come and wipe out an entire garden. And they Hello? Hello? What happened? I don't know. Went out. I don't know. I think she went out. It's on mute. Oh, she's on mute. Hey, Charlie, can you hear us? It's muted. Well, I have a little problem to reapply. Charlie, you were on mute. Can you repeat what you just said? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, tell me the last thing that you heard me say, because I was just going. You were talking about the deer fencing? Yes, so with it, you can put up the deer fencing because again, they can wipe out an entire garden in, in one night, especially if you have things like, uh, even like your edible landscaping, like hostas and uh, elephant ears, they'll come and eat all of that. So the best thing you can do is fencing. You can use coyote urine for them as well, but if they're hungry enough, they'll totally ignore it. And it would need to be a, um, reapplied each time that it rains to keep the strength. Charlie, so, somebody's asking you to uh, differentiate between mulch and compost. Okay. <clears throat> Someone tell me the difference between mulch and compost, because this, this you, you should have covered this when you were researching. So let's talk about this. What's the difference between mulch and compost? Compost is an additive to the soil that adds necessary nutrients, um, or is a type of plant food. And then compost is, um, it's not mixed in with the soil. It's like over the layer around, around the plant oh. to hold in oh. moisture. And okay, well, you, you flip that. And keep out weeds. Right, well, it, it, it's the opposite. Mulch is actually what you're putting around the plants. The comp compost means that it has had an opportunity to break down. So you can have mulch that turns into compost. So if I take a, a, a bag of leaves and I put it into my compost bin and I let it age and I'm adding soil and I'm adding my food scraps and everything else, what, we'll, it, what it will do is it'll turn into this beautiful brown hummus that we call compost. Mulch is it in its full stage. That's before it's broken down. So it is the, the complete um, carbon organic material that you're adding to keep moisture and that you're placing on top. Once it's broken mm -hmm. down this year, you can actually mix it into your beds at the end of the season and it'll compost right into that bed, meaning that it's gonna break down right into that bed and feed and fertilize your bed. Does that make sense? Yep, I, I must have accidentally gotten them said I'm wrong, but yep, we were on the Oh same no, page. oh no, no, I'm sorry, not for you, for the person who okay. had the question originally. <laughs> I knew you had it, you just flipped the word. So Charlie, that was my said, question, Charlie. You said that there was my question. You said there about was about mulch compost, Charlie. Oh, and I guess I just I'm trying to figure out how to keep water retention. Every time I try to mulch, people say good I'm, compost. I'm I'm sorry. The person who's speaking, um, there's some background noise, so I'm having a very difficult time hearing you. Sorry, I'm at a water park with my kids on vacation, oh. but I really <laughs> love, love <it>. gardening. <laughs> so I'm. Um, I'm trying to say whenever I want to pick a mulch for water retention in my garden bed, people say compost. 
So I'm just there confused you. as to which one I'm supposed to give. You're, if you're trying to put it on top for water retention, you're using mulch. And a lot of people use it interchangeably, but it's not the same thing. So when you think about mulch being the, like the whole pieces of wood or the whole leaves or the, even the shredded leaves and compost is once it's had a, a chance to age and break down and it'll almost have like a, almost a soil like feel, even though it may have larger chunks in it, it'll have more of a soil like feel because it's had an opportunity to break down. So the compost is just essentially just broken down mulch. And, I, and I'm sorry, I heard someone else with a question and then we are gonna go on because we have 14 more slides to get through in 30 minutes. Um, so the, I heard someone else asking a question about mulch. You wanna, did we already clarify it or do you still need to ask it? No, I was gonna ask about the, um, the neem oil and you said that there were different uh, pests that you used each of those three things for. And you said the BT was for the soft animals. What is the neem for? The, the neem oil you can actually use for both. You can actually use it uh, both for uh, um, pests that have an exoskeleton and you can use it for things that like caterpillars and so forth. I specifically, um, I primarily use um, DE for my squash bugs, my vine borers, you know, all of the pests that right now are trying to wipe out all of my hard work. And then for the caterpillars and, you know, the, the soft bugs, I use the BT. Okay. The reason that, that I have kind of shied away from using neem oil is just simply because those two have worked so well for me. I do still have neem oil. So if I have pests that, you know, are still trying to, you know, kick it uh, and remain alive after I've treated, then I will come back with neem oil. But neem oil, if, again, if it's not mixed correctly, can burn the leaves of your plant. So I'm just a little bit more cautious when I'm using that. And so let's go on to our third question, excuse me, our third homework assignment, which was regrowing vegetables. Who has some vegetables that they regrew that they want to talk about and possibly show us? I do. Okay. Okay, so um, I hope you can see this. These are uh, some green onions that I bought and I just kept the rubber band around it. And so um, if you can see this part the, at the bottom that looks lower, that is where I cut it at. And this is about on day three. And so it's already above and um, sprouted above that. And so I've, I've kept it in my windowsill mm -hmm. and uh, it's doing good so far. Awesome. Is this the first time you, you've regrown? Yes. Okay. Well, that is awesome. So in about six to seven days, you'll have enough where you can clip them. And again, if you just keep them in that water, they will consistently produce for you. So it's a really great way to not have to just keep buying them because that's the one thing I always forget until I need to cook. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, I, I, I have some of the same thing, but I also did it with um, celery. some celery mm. that I had uh, finished. And look at your little plant there. Awesome. I did this on Saturday and I was surprised. I have grown um, avocado um, seeds mm -hmm. in, into a plant. I just uh, stick With the, the avocado in a toothpick, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I have, mm -hmm. I have one on my um, deck now, but that, that's about a year old. Oh, that is awesome. That is one of my favorite things to start uh, are the avocados. And even though people tell me all the time it won't become true to seed and it'll be 20 years before I can get it, if <laughs> anything that I can regrow, I'm like, let's just try it. Mm -hmm. So thank you for sharing that. And I, I did see someone in text, text chat say that they were having some difficulties go on video, but that they were also um, able to restart some seeds. So that they started some um, a mango seed and cabbage. So great. That is awesome. Does anybody else have any that they started and want to share? I do. This is Andrea Bryan. And um, my, um, the onion, the scallion grew. Okay, let's see it. Uh, she seemed to be stuck. It, yeah, I think she's frozen. Yeah. My quick question is, do you put the green part in the dirt or you put the, the other part in the dirt? I, I got a little confused when it's time to put them in dirt. You mean for the, for which plant? The green onions? Any of them. 
When well, you you're plant. always, if you, when you get to the point where you're ready to plant your celery or you're ready to plant your green onions, you always want to make sure that the part that is rooted is the part that's going in the dirt. That's the green part that's up. No, wow. it's it's the it's the base of the plant. So if you that's look at great. my if you look at my my PowerPoint right here, do you see the celery that's growing there on the screen? Yes. Okay, that is an upright celery plant. So if I was going to put that in the ground with the the base still attached, I would take that whole thing with the leaf because again, your leaves are the part that's going to grow up out of the soil. So you want to make sure that those that's the part that's upright when you put it into the ground. Okay. When, when do you know that it's time to put it in the ground? Well, with, with, with the celery, I would actually, um, with yours, I would wait a few more weeks. I actually had a whole raised bed from celery that I had just recut. And I waited about six weeks before I put them in the ground because I started them this time of year when it was still very, very warm. So once you see a strong root system on there, you can put them in there. Or if you want to put them in early, you can. But I would do something like put a, uh, like a, greenhouse like over it and you can make a greenhouse remember we talked about this last week so if i needed to just make a greenhouse just to cover a plant so that it is just not getting sun scald what can i make a, a temporary greenhouse out of milk Gat jug gallon milk jug exactly. or water jug yep you can cut those in half and set it over on top of your plant so during the day it, it's just getting a chance to retain the moisture and grow or you can leave it in the house because again you can eat that celery right now. It's 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 ha gonna have its full flavor. There's no need for it to get 18 inches before you cut it. So you can actually leave it inside if you want and just clip it as you need it. I have a question. I've grown it before and it's gotten about that big, but then it just turned it turns really brown and it rots. So I have a little one coming up for the celery and for the romaine lettuce, it's a little bit coming up. Mm -hmm. I see. But it's it's brown. So you want to make sure when you're putting it in the water that there's, it just needs water on its roots. If you're putting water around the stalk of the celery, it's going to rot. So what you can do is as it starts to rot, don't leave it on there, peel it back. So go ahead okay. and start, um, go ahead and start uh, peeling back. I see that, I'm sorry guys, I see that you guys are very busy in text chat. I'm excited to see this. So uh, you're gonna pull back the, the greenery, greenery, the part that starts to brown and starts to rot so that it doesn't impact the stem. Because again, anything wet, even the other part of the celery, anything wet that lays against the stem is going to rot the stem as well. Okay, is, celery fall, is celery a fall plant? Should, yes. Should we wait celery, till it's a little cooler? Yes, you can actually start putting in your fall garden. I would, I'm actually putting in mine now. Um, I thought we were going to have some time to let me start my fall garden with you guys, but you guys have a lot of great questions, so it looks like we'll be holding that for next week as well. But yes, you can start your, your seeds now uh, for your fall garden. Indoors? You actually, you can start them indoors or you can start them outdoors. If you're going to start them outdoors, I would do what we call interplanting. Someone remind me what interplanting is. In between the taller plants so they can be like shaded basically. Exactly. So those are your, your vegetables. Um, so if you have large tomato or squash um, or even sunflowers right now that are, <laughs> that are shading the ground, you can go ahead and start putting in your fall garden under those vegetables so they can benefit from that shade and won't get that um, that major heat from the sun, which will cause them to bolt. Because the main reason that we don't put cold weather vegetables out right now, like lettuce and uh, kale and broccoli and so forth, is because right now, if you, if you, um, if they're in full sun, they'll do what's called bolting, which means they'll have small leaves and it'll immediately try to flower. So making sure that you are either starting them inside or that they have a piece of shade uh, so that they can kind of get strong before, um, you know, uh, before the summer ends is a, is a great way to get jump started on your garden. Okay, and go ahead. So this one's mine. I don't think I did it right. I'm completely new to this. I just started planting over the weekend some collard green seeds, but I cut part of this onion and put it in the water and it doesn't look like it's doing very well. So Okay, and someone tell me why her onion isn't doing well. Someone looking at this. <laughs> it should be wrong. upside down the other way. <laughs> with Yes, so you're gonna oh, you're gonna the flip that way. onion up. 
Mm -hmm. It's upside down. <laughs> so that part is, is actually the part that is, and that, that's, there's no poor questions in this. Um, so that's exactly how you should have it right there. So that's the part that needs the water. And so now that you have it like that, give it a few days and you'll start seeing those greens pop up. Now, for the sake of time, I am okay. so excited to see all of us regrowing vegetables, but we're going to go on. Otherwise, we're not going to get past our homework review. Okay. Okay, so this is gonna be a quick slide. I just kind of wanted to talk about technology and gardening. Um, when I was new to gardening, this was, you know, YouTube was still a very, very new thing. You know, now if I have a question, you know, I've, when I started gardening, I did the Master Gardeners program. Um, and then I also started volunteering with an organization called Wolf, which is the World Organization of Organic Farmers. Again, Wolf like a dog. Um, and what that allowed me to do is it gave me an opportunity to go and work on other organic farms and get hands-on training and they provide room and board um, and you go into the website and you can do it internationally or or locally so I've gone and volunteered um, in Spain I went to uh, for two weeks to a, a garden in Spain and it just gave me an opportunity to just see different organic practices and kind of learn some things that I wouldn't have been able to otherwise but now we have technology. So if I wanted to find out about how to put a garden plan together, or if I wanted to track my garden, I keep a garden journal. And for you first time gardeners, I would suggest that you do also, because now you feel like you're gonna remember it, but you won't. And I promise you that you won't remember everything you need to remember for next year. So I take pictures of my plants. If I have a, a plant that gets attacked by tomato hornworms, which by the way, you guys, I've never had a tomato hornworm in 13 years of gardening. Um, if I do have plants that are getting attacked, I'm taking a picture of the plant, where it was planted, um, the time of year that you know it started, what I did to treat it, whether or not it was beneficial. And the reason for that is because gardening is an investment and I don't want to spend the money to just feed the animals. You know, I, I love all the animals, but I'd like to eat my garden as well. So I use a lot of apps that, that kind of help me just kind of keep track of that. I used to keep a written journal, but with technology, I don't necessarily um, have to as much. If you have an Android or you have an iPhone, you already have things built into your phone like Google Lens and Bixby, which will allow you to take a picture and it'll tell you what that plant is or what that bug is or what that spider is. And especially ladies, what that snake is. I get so many questions about, is this snake something that should survive? And yes, if you have a snake, leave it. If it's there, he has a food source and I'm sure you'd rather have that snake than whatever uh, rodent he's trying to get. So when we're talking about putting a garden plan together, a garden plan is exactly what it sounds like. It is a map and a plan of what you're going to plant, where it's going to be placed in the garden, and so forth. And so there are several different apps um, that you can use that will just kind of help you with that. And not all of these are apps. Uh, so for those of you who don't care to use your, your smartphones like that, there are websites that you can go to. And so I listed a lot of different varieties of um, apps or websites that I have personally used that I would suggest if you're trying to put your garden plan together. And we're gonna talk about that on the next slide. There are other apps that there are a lot of times when you're growing something in a garden and you're baby in it and you're like, oh my gosh, it's my most beautiful plant. And then you realize you've been nursing a weed. So having something like where you're able to take a picture of the leaf or take a picture of the plant, these apps uh, will actually be able to tell you once you take the picture exactly what it is. And sometimes if you're still not quite sure, because it'll give you a suggestion of five to seven different plants, they'll have other people on there who are experienced gardeners or even garden experts who are able to answer for you and definitively tell you exactly what something is. And so there are just a lot of really, really great um, apps. The other one is identifying bugs. Again, that was the, the key point of the homework last night, excuse me, last week, was not just to make sure that you were aware of what different pests wanted to attack different plants. It was to give you an opportunity to research and see pictures of them, see them, what they look like in their egg cycle, what they look like in their nymph cycle, so that as soon as you see them, you're able to quickly identify and say, you know what, he's got to go. And so I want you to just kind of get comfortable with making sure that anytime you see something in your garden that you don't know what it is, especially if it's a bug, that you know how to research and figure out whether or not it's a friend or a foe. Because not every bug is a foe, um, but the ones that are, you want to know them immediately because 24 hours can be the difference between a garden making it or not. Okay. And before we go on to technology and gardening, do we have any additional questions? 
Okay, I see a hand up, but I don't hear any questions. Okay, I have one. This is Andrea Bryant. Um, about the use of vinegar and water, it is good for to for insects to keep them out, and also cayenne pepper and water in a spray bottle. Yes, cayenne pepper and water. Yes, I personally don't suggest vinegar and water in the garden for new gardeners. I'm going to tell you why. Can anybody tell me the number one way to get rid of um, weeds in your grass if you don't want to um, use any type of uh, chemical? Salt is the number one way to, to kill like crabgrass in your yard. Salt. Is it baking soda and, and vinegar? Yep. Vinegar, you can do it even with just vinegar and water. If you go and, and saturate your, your weed and like that's growing in, like your driveway, if it's growing like the crack of your driveway, if you saturate it with vinegar, it's going to kill that plant. So you can use vinegar and water, but again, because you all are growing so many different things, and I know we have some people who may be outside of Georgia, um, vinegar and water is one of those things that I won't be specifically uh, giving you instructions on how to, but you can use it, but you just want to make sure that you are very, very careful in its application because you can accidentally use the wrong strength or use the wrong amount and kill your plant. Okay. And we are going to go on. I think the person who raised their hand just has their hand stuck. So let's go ahead and go on and let's talk about a garden plant. Someone tell me what a garden plan is. What's a garden plan? Putting it where you want. You, you're, you're checking out the spaces and you're planting it out real good where the, the tomatoes are not above. The, you're just organizing yourself. And how, how much you, room you have. Exactly. So those are all, it, everything you, you both said is exactly correct. The purpose of doing a garden plan is because there are so many different factors that are going to impact how well your garden grew. I'm sure for my new gardeners, when you put in those little bitty baby plants at the beginning of the season, you had them too close together because in your mind, you can't really fathom something that starts the size of a mustard seed, you know, six weeks later being three feet wide. So a garden plan is so essential, especially for new garden, gardeners, because it gives you an opportunity to see how much space each of those plants need, the best place to place them in the garden. Um, because again, what matters when you're putting your garden together is, does this plant require sunlight versus shade? How much, um, you know, is the area that you're gonna be placing it in windy? So if you know that there is a very windy part of your, your yard, that's probably not where I would put my vining beans. Um, you also want to make sure that wherever you're setting up your garden has great drainage. If you have a garden and it's uh, at the bottom of a hill or if it's right next to your air conditioning unit that this time of year is putting out a lot of condensation and water, you know, you want to make sure that you are aware of all of the things that you, um, that all of the factors that can impact the health and the growth of your garden. And also access to water. Um, when people set up their gardens at the beginning of the season, I always tell them to remember that you live in Georgia. And what happens in Georgia from June through September is that we get into triple digits. And so if you have to go out there and water your garden and you don't have like the soaker hose system or anything like that, you don't want to have to make a bunch of different trips with water to water it. So you want to make sure that you're planting that garden so that you can quickly and efficiently get to water uh, where it's not a hardship when necessary. And, and you guys, my apologies, I have uh, some baby chicks who are three feet outside of my door. So if you hear a bunch of chicks, that's why. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and go on to the next page. Miss Charlie, will you be sharing this, um, your slides? Yes, the uh, PowerPoint, okay. and, and if you attend next week's class, I'll have all of the information for you. Um, De um, DeKalb County that is uh, doing this class, they are actually going to be placing these on YouTube at some point. Bridget, I'm not sure if you know the schedule, but if not, um, I will find out for sure. And next week, I'll have that information available to you of whether or not it's already available or when it will be available. Hey, Charlie, I'm oh. going to work on that this weekend. So hopefully by Monday or Tuesday, the latest, they'll be out. Is that Sandra? It is. Oh, look at who snuck in. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Sandra. Great job. Thanks. I love it. Thank you. Sandra's who, who put this together and, and got me to, to, to uh, do this six-part series. So thank you again, Sandra. Um, so talking about the garden plan continued, 
um, again, with your garden plan, you can put in everything. So if you're going to be putting in structures like a gazebo, or for me, my fantasy is a she shed, you can put all of that. So all of these different uh, apps that I was showing you in the different websites, it will actually allow you to drag and drop any structure. Uh, so it's not just your plants that you can plan out. You can put together the full design of your garden and be able to see a picture of it. Tell me another benefit, especially for someone who's been gardening since the beginning of this year. Tell me another benefit to having a garden plan. So you remember what you planted. Absolutely. I wrote out hundreds of tags, hundreds and hundreds of tags and used brown and purple markers. So you, of course, know all of those labels are back white. So having a garden plan, I can usually look at my garden. Well, I can always look at what's growing and know exactly what it is. But I get a lot of visitors and for, you know, other people living in my home with me when I send them downstairs, I don't want them coming back up saying, I don't know what this is. So making sure that you have a list of what's planted and where is another really great thing so that if you have a situation like me at the beginning of the, at the end of the season where you can no longer tell what's growing uh, you have a full listing and then it also helps you decide what you want to plant the next year based on how well that that plant went um, before we go on to the next slide are there any questions on this okay well let's go on Okay, so when we're talking about uh, doing a garden plan, one of the things that comes up also consistently is companion planting. Compl companion planting is essentially the practice of planting beneficial plants together for things such as pest control, pollination, providing habitat for your beneficial insects, and also making sure that you're capitalizing on your space. One example of this, how many of you have heard of the Three Sisters? Anyone familiar with that, the Three Sisters, when it comes to gardening? I heard of it. Okay, so Three Sisters is an old Native American tradition, and the Three Sisters were corn, beans, and squash. The uh, corn allowed the, um, the, excuse me, the corn stalk allowed the beans to grow up it, and they also provided shade, and the, um, the squash itself provided shade for the soil so that the corn didn't have to be watered as much, and the beans provide nitrogen for both the corn and the, the squash to just, so they're all working as one cohesive thing. So that's why it's called the Three Sisters. There are other things that should be planted together. I'm sure uh, for those of you who are, uh, who've been gardening for a while, you've heard about planting marigolds with your squash or putting basil in with your tomatoes and putting basil in with your tomatoes. My ladies who said they've had issues with hornworms, putting basil in with your tomatoes will keep those hornworms away as well. So, if you're having some issues with hornworms, putting those basil in with the tomatoes. And there's also another benefit to putting in basil with tomatoes. Anyone know what it is? It makes a great meal. Well, that too, but the, the basil actually improves the flavor of the tomatoes. The basil actually improves the flavor of the tomatoes when they're planted together. So that's a, another great benefit to putting those together. So we so, are gonna go ahead. Quick question, sorry. Okay. Um, so it's one plant per square foot for a tomato. Do we put like just one plant of basil in that square foot too? Well, actually hold that question because you're going to be the one who answers that for us next week because that's going to be one of the things that you're going to be doing for your oh. homework. Okay, so I, I have a companion planting guide in here. And if you guys will just write this down, companion planting guide. There, the two that I'm showing you on here are the two I always suggest for both new and experienced growers. And so it will tell you based on what the plant is, what a good companion for it, as well as what you should not plant next to it. Because it's not necessarily just that you need to know what should be planted together. You also really need to know what should not be planted together. Because there are certain things when they're planted next to each other that can uh, prohibit the growth. It can attract different pests. It can cause disease. So you want to make sure that you kind of learn what should and should not be planted together. And you don't have to memorize this. This information is always going to be re readily available. So this is one guide that I absolutely love. And again, all you're Googling is companion planting guide. And then if we can go on to the next slide. I'm sure you cannot see this at all. Um, but this com 
companion planting chart right here not only tells you what should and should not be planted together, but if you look on the right hand side, it will also tell you some natural insect repellent tips. And again, if you just Google companion planting chart, I promise you this will be one of the first 10 that come up. So it'll tell you that if you have aphids, that you can do nestoriums, that you can do basil, that you can do onions. So it's gonna tell you some of the different things to plant around your plant. So in the beginning, we talked about the fact that someone was saying that they had um, white flies on a specific plant. I can look on here and see what is a deterrent for you know white flies or for the cabbage butterfly so that I know what I need to plant together and then I can just double check on my companion chart whether or not that is what should go around it. So this is a really great resource to figure out what should, should not be planted together. And this is really something that you're going to want to, to have accessible when you are putting together your garden plan. Hint, hint, that's your homework for next week. So let's go on to the next slide. But before we do, um, I'm going to just pause here to see what additional questions we have. And then we're going to go over what our homework is going to be. I just want to be sure I'm clear. We should not be putting like the BT and the diatomaceous earth on the same thing, or should is that okay? Um, you you shouldn't really have to. You mm -hmm. shouldn't really have to. Yes, you can put both BT and DE on the same plant, but you really shouldn't have. If if you were having a, a a pest issue to the point where you're just having to drown the plant then there is an, a soil issue. You have a soil oh. health issue. Um, again, like I said, I've never had tomato worms. Um, I've had the um, tomato um, fruit worms one time, and I think I, I probably saw three in 13 years. Um, so there are a lot of things that I don't experience in the garden because the one thing that I make sure that I do at the beginning of every year is make sure that my soil is as healthy as possible because healthy soil will reduce the amount of pests that you see. Okay. And that's okay. just based off of the, the 50, 25, 25 rule that you gave us last week, right? Yes. There, there are some other things. Are you, are you here in life, Elia? I'm not sure who's speaking. Yes, I am. Are, are you, um, I'm going to actually, um, if you want to stay around after chat, I'm going to shoot you my number. You're more than welcome to come by and see how we're growing right now. It is suffering because we are in major drought but you are more than welcome to kind of see some of the other things that I add. And when we finally do have enough time left at the end of a class, I'll take you outside and just show you some of the different things that I use to maintain the garden as well. But I will tell you this, I've only treated my garden maybe twice this year. Most of my pest control, and I'm sure for those of you who are squeamish, you're not going to want to hear this, but most of my pest control is by hand. Um, I know what I'm looking for. I know that the Japanese beetles I don't want. I know the squash beetles I don't want. And so I have cans throughout my garden. And if you ever come over and I see a bug, you'll see me immediately pick up the can and swipe it in there. I'm out you know, looking regularly for eggs. I get the tape, like the uh, masking tape or... Um, the duct tape, wrap it around my hand and I can rip the, um, the eggs off by just pressing the tape against the leaf. Or if the leaf is too far gone, I remove the entire leaf. So most of my, my pest control is by hand. It's not the most glorious, but uh, it's working, so. So and, I have, and then, I have, oh, I'm sorry. Oh no, I was just gonna also say one last tool that if I, I don't think I would have gardened past the first five years if I didn't buy this, but I bought a hand vac specifically for the garden because I, I had a major bug phobia and if a bug touched me or looked at me, I would lose it. So I bought a hand vac so that I could get rid of them without having to, um, you know, to touch them. But I'm sorry, go ahead with your question. And who is so, this little cutie on the screen? That's my grandbaby. <laughs> so what I have like basil, and I have uh, a couple of other uh, herbs, but they're starting to flower. So last week, I remember you told me to just kind of pluck the flowers off. But, yeah. but is it time for me to kind of like take them out? No. And, no? No. Just keep, just if, keep if, popping out the flower? If you, if you keep pinching the flowers, that basil will grow as long as you allow it to. And then let me just tell you this also. If you cut off just the top stem, if you just go across it with scissors and cut that basil back, it will completely and totally regrow. You mean cut and, the, you mean cut like the leaves and everything off of it with that? Yes. 
Yes. Oh, if, okay. if, you, if you if you cut it to leave about six inches of, of um, above the ground, if you go across it and cut it, you can harvest the full amount of your basil and it will fully regrow from that stem. It'll, it'll regrow a new plant. You have plenty of time. But if you if you don't have a need for that much basil, yes, you want to just keep pinching those flowers. And that's for anything. Like if you're growing greens right now or lettuce, I guarantee you that it's it's trying to flower. So if you want to continue eating them, you always want to make sure you pinch the flowers because if not, the plant will concentrate on um, on flowering and not on producing leaves, and it will also change the flavor and it will become a little bit more bitter. And, and it's not something that you'll probably want to use. The oregano, though, it's flowering. It's it flowers too fast. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure what I should could I should I cut it back as well? Yes, you can cut oregano back. And 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 let me just say this also, guys. I have not most of my herbs I haven't planted in at least ten years. I do allow most of uh, my herbs to self seed. Um, I don't water my herbs at all. Herbs are very forgiving. They are, um, they grow like weeds, and that's why most people will not put them in their, their garden beds or, you know, and which I understand, but they will grow like weeds. And so you can be, um, you can abuse them a bit and they'll still survive. Hmm. Can, can we exchange numbers, us too, just in case we want to over the week discuss something as a group? Can we put our number on the on the site here? Um, I'm going to defer that to Sandra or Bridget. If we were able to just do individually private, but I can't speak with someone private. There's a couple of people I would just like to talk with them maybe during the week if we had to, you know, a question maybe I could answer. And then we won't ask you so many questions. We make it work ourselves. Together. You're trying to you're trying to get with um members in the class. Is that yes. it? Yes. Okay. If only if they want, they don't have to. It's just, you know, exchange a number if they want to call. So what I, I will say is um, you know, you guys can do a private chat. Anybody who is okay with um maybe Donna just you know, communicating with you over the weekend um, about gardening issues, um, go ahead and just send her a private chat with your number. You guys can exchange that way. How do you do it? That's my problem. <laughs> I'm, I've been trying because there's a couple of people I tried to probably speak to and I can't get it up where that I can probably just give them my number. Well, Donna, what, what, um, I would suggest is that we, because we only have a couple of minutes left in this class, if we can hold that until the next class, and what I'll do is if we can log in, you know, five to 10 minutes early, maybe we can put together a, a shared contact list for anyone who would like to share it, and we can put it in, in text chat if anyone uh, would like to exchange numbers to be able to keep in contact after class. Thank you. Absolutely. And that's a great idea. And, and I will say this, I, I know some of you are in the garden group on next door, but we have a garden group on next door called um, Raised Bed Gardening. We have about 155 members and this is what we do. We talk about the issues that we have. People are able to post their pictures and their problems and we're able to you know, kind of help them through it. There are quite a few gardeners uh, of every uh, experience level in there. So if you are on the next door app, if you look for Raised Bed Garden, uh, you'll find that our group. Okay, and let's go over the homework because we are right at four o'clock and so I'm gonna talk fast. And I lost the PowerPoint. Bridget, can we, can we go to the last slide of the PowerPoint? Okay, there's one more slide after that, my apologies. Okay, and so here is your homework. I'm gonna leave this up on the screen. I'm gonna go through it very, very quickly since we're over time. I want you using your phone um, or any of the, the plant apps that I showed you on the screen earlier, I want you to identify three plants this week, either in your yard or while you're walking your neighborhood or anywhere. I want you to just tell, find three plants that you don't know what they are now and figure out what they are using one of the um, either Google resources, the Google lens on your phone or one of the apps that we shared earlier. The second thing is I want you to put together a fall garden plan. So if you have not started putting your garden plan together, I want you to write out 
everything that you're going to plant and then I want you to use either one of those websites or use an app if you don't have them you can just google uh, free garden plans or free garden planning app and several will come up but I want you to have a comprehensive garden plan together and like the young lady mentioned earlier the garden plan will also tell you um, how much space each plant needs so it will tell you you know to not put you know anything within 18 inches of a watermelon and so forth and so it gives you a lot of great information most of those garden planting sites will also tell you how to tend for the plants throughout the year so once you set it up and you're telling it that you're growing brussels sprouts and kale and broccoli it will send you a reminder when it needs to be watered when it should be fed when it should be treated when it should be harvested so it will have all of that information already built into those apps and so it's just a great easy way to simplify your garden and then the last thing that I want you to do is identify what your companion plants should be for what you are planning for your garden. So again, we're putting a garden plan together of what we want in our fall garden. We're gonna figure out what companion plants need to be uh, placed together in our fall garden and what companion plants we might be able to add to protect our garden. And then we're also going to find three things that we're not familiar with and use an app to identify them and come back with that information next class. Um, and I know we're over the limit and I that we have to have to go, but before we do, are there any questions that you all have on the homework only? You put a couple of, you uh, said a couple of apps, but I missed them. Can you put them in the chat or tell us those apps again? Suggest we, what I'm gonna do is just have Bridget just go back to that slide. Okay. Um, it, and then we can just leave it up on the screen and as everybody signs out, if you have an opportunity to write them down. And Bridget, I think it was about five slides ago. If somebody know, just tell her. That'll help. <laughs> what was what was her question again? Because I might have wrote it down. Well, her question was, can she see the list of the garden apps? So if anybody wrote it down, um, like the, the apps to identify plants or the identify yeah. the bugs. And then I'll also tell Google. you this time. Okay, there you go. That's the companion Thank plant and choice. Well, she's, she's, still, mm -mm, she's still going back for you. There it is. These are the ones. And so again, the first one is for um, apps that will help you with a garden plan or tracking your garden. The next one is if you want to identify plants. And then the last one is if you want to identify a bug. And so we're going to go ahead and just leave that up on the screen for a few minutes. So if anybody wants to jot any of those down. And, and I know they said Google Lens. Yes. That's for, that's for tracking, right? Well, well, Google Lens, Google Lens, what it, it's actually something that comes up. If you have an Android phone and you're trying to take a picture, it gives you an option to do Google Lens depending on what type of smartphone you have. Okay. And once you take that picture, it'll tell you exactly what you're looking at. It's just okay. a way to identify what you're looking at. Okay. So, so it's doing the same thing as these apps. Mm -hmm. Tracker apps is like the smart plant, garden manager. Just about three of them is all you need. You don't need all that many. Well, well, oh, no, you don't need all of them. I just wanted to give you some different options so that okay. if you just kind of wanted to see which one felt comfortable for you to use. But oh. no, you don't have to download all of them. I just wanted to show you some of the different ones that were available. Okay, so I put two in each one, really. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that's good. And then the ID and the bug is the naturalist picture. Mm. I all naturalist. Right. Mm -hmm. I got okay. it. And so I thank it, you. Guys. I wasn't the one who asked. I hope she has it. <laughs> yeah, I got it. I just took a picture of the of slide. Right. Take a screenshot. Exactly. <laughs> So thank you guys so much for another great class. I hope to see all of you um, next Friday with your homework. Um, again, I'll make sure that we have uh, the link and everything available for those of you who want to see this on YouTube. And I have, hope you have a happy gardening week next week. And you guys enjoy.